One time after church, I was cleaning up the pulpit and getting ready to leave church. And then a father came up to me with his little girl, and she was crying, and I knew something was wrong. And he said, my daughter has something to tell you. And she said, Pastor Mark, I took a ring pop without asking you. I'm sorry, I really wanted one. And she was weeping. And I felt so bad, I was ready to give her my whole bag of <laughs> ring pops, you know. But I had to support the father and what he was trying to teach his daughter. It was a very important lesson. And so I said, I forgive you, my child. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And she gave me back the ring pop, and she and her dad went home. You know, we've all made mistakes. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it's wonderful to know that we can be forgive, forgiven, even if it's something we intentionally did. That's what the beginning of Leviticus 6 is talking about with regard to the guilt offering. The Lord said to Moses, If anyone sins and is unfaithful to the Lord by deceiving his neighbor about something entrusted to him, or left in his care, or stolen, or if he cheats him, you're cheating hard. <laughs> so this is amazing because this is the first time in Leviticus We've seen that God has made provision even for people who had sinned with the high hand, provided that they take ownership over their sin, that they acknowledge their sin, and they come to God confessing their sin. Let's read on. What other situations? Or if he cheats him, verse 3, or if he finds lost property and lies about it, or if he swears falsely, or if he commits any such sin that people may do. <laughs> that covers the gamut. Verse 4, when he thus sins and becomes guilty, he must return what he has stolen or taken by extortion, or what was entrusted to him, or the lost property he found, or whatever it was he swore falsely about. He must make restitution in full, add a fifth of the value to it, and give it all to the owner on the day he presents his guilt offering. So if you sin with a high hand, it's not enough to just bring a sacrifice and say, I'm, and say, I'm sorry. you got to make restitution. You have to make peace with your fellow man as well as with your father. You go on the same day you're offering, you're offering to God. You go to your neighbor and say, I apologize for what I did. This is to make up for what I stole or what I took or what I lied about. And I'm adding restitution. I'm adding 20% of the value to what I broke or what I took. And so that's what it means to come to God and experience grace, is to not only look up to God, but to look horizontally at whoever it is on this earth that you need to make peace with. And the New Testament teaches a very similar principle. Jesus said so in the Sermon on the Mount. How do I know that? Matthew 5, 23, Jesus says, If you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come back and offer your gift. This is kind of doing the same pattern. First go to your brother, apologize, replace what was stolen, add 20% to the value, and then come to God and make your offering. It's the same thing. Verse 6, and as a penalty, he must bring to the priest, that is to the Lord, his guilt offering, a ram from the flock. And a ram, that's one of the, the more expensive possessions that somebody would have in their flock. One without defect and of the proper value. In this way, the priest will make atonement for him before the Lord, and he will be forgiven for any of these things he did that made him guilty. So in all of these instances, the man is seeing the cost of his sin as well as experiencing forgiveness. The cost of replacing what was stolen, the cost of adding 20% to the value, the cost of the ram being brought to the priest, and then he had to kill the ram himself so he would see the blood flow, and he would see, hey, sin is costly. It affects. It's not a good thing. 
And now in verse 8, we move on to the burnt offering, which reminds us of our continual need of forgiveness. The Lord said to Moses, give Aaron and his sons this command. These are the regulations for the burnt offering. The burnt offering is to remain on the altar hearth through that, throughout the night till morning. And the fire must be kept burning on the altar. The priest shall then put on his linen clothes with linen undergarments next to his body and shall remove the ashes of the burnt offering that the fire has consumed on the altar and place them beside the altar. So the priest had to ensure that he was keeping holy as he ministered in the holy place. Then he is to take off these clothes and put on others and carry the ashes outside the camp to a place that is ceremonially clean. Notice verse 12, the fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must not go out. Verse 13, the fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. That speaks to the fact that we need a continuous access to God, a continuing need of forgiveness and burnt offerings had to be offered around the clock practically because you never know at what time that a sin is going to be committed and an offering needs to be made and thank god that we have a continual offering before god today once and for all jesus christ gave his body and blood on the cross hebrews chapter 10 verse 10 and through him, we have a continuing provision of forgiveness when we go to him for grace and mercy. So Jesus replaces the need for all of these offerings, but each one of these offerings points to an aspect of Christ. I think maybe in a couple of days, I'll do that. I'll sum that up. I'll have a devotion where I talk about how Jesus fulfills each of these offerings in a concise manner. Verse 14, we move on to a, a brief discussion about the grain offering. These are the regulations for the grain offering. Aaron's sons are to bring it before the Lord in front of the altar. The priest takes a handful of fine flour and oil together with all the incense on the grain offering and burn the memorial portion on the altar as an, as an aroma to the Lord. Aaron and his sons, verse 16, shall eat the rest of it. And any male descendant of Aaron can eat it, according to verse 18. So if something is offered on behalf of an individual, if an individual is making a peace offering and wants to celebrate the peace he has with God, the priests are allowed to eat with him in fellowship. But look at verse 19. The Lord also said to Moses, this is the offering Aaron and his sons are to bring to the Lord on the day he is anointed. So, on the day the priest is anointed, they bring an offering of fine flour as a grain offering. And verse 22, it is the Lord's regular share and is to be burned completely. So, when you're dedicating a priest, when you're having an ordination ceremony, the priests don't get to eat that. That all gets presented to the Lord. Verse 24. Some final instructions about the sin offering again. The Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron and his sons, these are the regulations for the sin offering. The sin offering is to be slaughtered before the Lord in the place the burnt offering is slaughtered. It is most holy. The priest who offers it shall eat it. It is to be eaten in a holy place. So when an offering is made on behalf of an individual, the priest is able to eat a portion of that. Let's see. Verse 30. But if any sin offering whose blood is brought into the tent of meeting is to make atonement in the holy place, that must not be eaten. It must be burned. And I think the idea behind that is that if you bring the blood into the tent of meeting to make national atonement, that is not to be eaten. Individ for an individual, yes but not for national. So these are some more regulations for the offering. And very briefly, I'll just say that Jesus Christ does fulfill them all. He is the burnt offering. He's the giving of God's best, just as the burnt offering is the giving of our best. He is the peace and the fellowship offering, because just as that offering celebrates the peace we can have with God because of the burnt offering, we celebrate peace with God because of Jesus' offering on the cross. The guilt offering, 
Jesus cleanses us from all our guilt. Romans 8.1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so all these things, and that sin offering, it says in 1 Peter 2.24, Jesus bore in his body on the tree our sins, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness, and by his wounds you have been healed. So thank God for Jesus. Thank God that we don't have to do all this stuff, that all this stuff points ahead to what Jesus is all going to do for us. And we just need to repent, receive, and believe. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. You guys have a wonderful day. I think I'm going to head over to the church. Jeannie's having a brief vacation Bible school meeting. I want to be a part of that. I'll probably visit a couple people today on my birthday. And then tonight, Jeannie's taking me out to eat at Cobblestone. You know how they send out those coupons for your birthday? You get up to $10 off or something like that. Anyways, we're going to Cobblestone. You guys have a great day, and God bless.